Welcome back, baseball fans, to 1970-73. Keep, wave, or retire. Part 3. Where we left off last time. We had done two-thirds of the reconciliations for the teams, getting to us towards the playoff teams, the teams down here, picking 21st through 32nd in the draft. And uh, we have resolved... All of that completing the carousel, meaning that every team has four keepers, two waves, and two retires, sufficiently set up to start a draft, but of course the draft won't be until 2022. There's a lot of analysis to do of the cards. And again, the, you, there can still be more transactions in the Hot Stove League, but of course um, it would have to make everybody would still have to have a proper number of keeper waves and retires so let's just go and see what transactions wrap this up starting with we can start with Las Vegas but we know that they uh, reconciled in the last video and um, they started with only three keepers and to that uh, Vegas did add a starting pitcher. It was a, it was a uh, combination of two trades. They started off with Jim Bunning because he pitched on the rotation, and then they bumped him up to Ray Culp, who also goes on three days rest, but he has an ERA closer to three, whereas Bunning's final year is closer to four. So that's how Vegas finishes at 40202, and then they're done not making moves. The next team after Vegas is Kansas City. And they had five keepers. And when we look at the five keepers for Kansas City, it was Kelly, Kirkpatrick, Pinella, Rooker, Bunker. And then they also have Drabowski and Bill Butler as wavered guys who they could keep and they could move Bunker to waivers depending if they prefer a lefty over a righty. So they had a decision to make as who do they move on from? And I know that all these guys would move on eventually. Pat Kelly goes from KC to the White Sox at a certain point. Kirkpatrick moves. Pinella moves eventually to the Yankees. Rooker moves to the Pirates. So of all these transactions, I was looking for the one that seemed to help the two teams the most. And the guy to move is Jim Rooker. And the reason for movement of Rooker is that he really blossoms in Pittsburgh more than in Kansas City. So the trade that is made, these are the last trades we saw. And here's the first trade we see in this video. Kansas City sends Jim Rooker to the Pirates for a retired player. Kansas City will get a draft token out of that. What the Pirates ending up doing after acquiring the keeper, lefty Jim Rooker, is that they had lefty keeper Bob Veal, but now they put him on waivers as he statistically starts to decline and they're gonna let him look for work. Remember, the Pirates were a team that was a big disappointment in the previous season and they're looking to rebound in a big way. And so they're gonna make big moves with Bob Moose will be a lot better. Rooker will be a lot better. Al Oliver, Richie Hebner, already to a very potent team. And they're going to run this thing back and hopefully leapfrog the Reds. Remember, the Pirates win the National League East in three of the four years. So they're due to win, even though they're in a division with the Cincinnati Reds. It's gonna, it should be a better fight, at least this year, you would think. So that reconciliation gets Pirates up to 40202 and Kansas City by making that one deal. And you see there's Rich Nye, the retired player Kansas City did. They're also 40202. So one play, one trade helps both teams. Next up is Houston. And they didn't do anything. They started at 40202. With Jim Wynn, Durker, LeMaster, and Merritt. And they stay that way. With 
Jim Wynn, Dirk Lemaster, and Merritt. Now, one other move that I had to make, clerical move, is that I talked in an earlier video that the Astros played last year with Marty Martinez's 1969 card, which gave them nine 69 cards, and they should have been playing with his 1970 card. Statistically, his 1970 card is a lot worse. So the punishment is simple. <laughs> They're going to play this year with Marty Martinez's 1970 card, and they can't cut him or replace him with a different player. No other uh, uh, mistake needs to be rectified in that. Um, I made the mistake, and they uh, they got a 300 hitting Marty Martinez ca card when they shouldn't have had to. Um, and there's a big gap between his 69 and 70 performance. But otherwise, it's not a very noteworthy transaction. Doesn't really affect any of the other transactions that are being made. Next is Baltimore. They were they made to make just one move. The Orioles started with five keepers. And that was definitely going to be tough to figure out between Blair, Elrod Hendricks, Frank Robinson, Cuellar, and Dick Hall. Obviously, Elrod Hendricks is the weakest of those guys. He gets moved on to an expansion team, the Ohio Players, for a retired player. And that transaction was done in the last round. And then Baltimore didn't do anything else except for adding a waiver Espermonte card for another retired player. Baltimore's ready to go. Next up, Oakland. Starting at 30203, they needed a keeper and get rid of a retired guy. They did that transaction through getting Ken Holtzman off the Cardinals. There was another play pitcher involved in the deal. Oakland started with just three keepers, you see here. Nice flip over to the fixed version of it. And now you see they've got four. The fourth keeper is Ken Holtzman. And uh, they also ended up picking up Rich, Rick Alston as a lefty reliever for Danny Combs and losing a token to the Cardinals in that deal. But that's the only deal Oakland made. Uh, Dodgers only had to make one more transaction, and it was a minor one. Let's see, which they did. The Dodgers... They uh, acquired Earl Wilson for a retired pitcher in the previous round. It was a minor deal. Again, a lot of minor deals between trading a wavered guy for a retired guy. I think we, this is, yeah, it happened in the end of the last video, actually. This is the only deal the Dodgers made. No tokens are involved, unless there's a player of value, like a Jim Rooker uh, getting moved. That's worth a token, but otherwise, wavered and retired guys generally don't generate tokens. All right, after the Dodgers, the next, oh, this was great. California and Cincinnati both needed to reconcile one pick apart from each other, and they traded with each other. And it worked out perfectly, a, a wave for a retired guy. California sent waived Mike Shannon, infielder, to Cincinnati for a retired infielder, Ray Euler, and both teams got to the magic number of 40202. They had made other trades in the previous videos. Giants are all done as well. And now we got one more kind of blockbuster trade involving the Red Sox and the Yankees and one other team. Let's take a look at that now. So in a series of two trades, here we go. We came with the notion that the Red Sox weren't willing to trade Sparky Law to the Yankees directly because I'm using some uh, historical perspective that the Red Sox didn't have when they made the deal for Danny Cater. And so it's a two-team trade with Colorado being the uh, intermediary there. So Boston sends Sparky Lyle, um, who really had a lackluster 1970, by the way, uh, to Colorado for another lackluster player, Joe LaHood. And the Red Sox will pick up a token for LaHood. Uh, LaHood played for Boston, and he missed a couple years and then returned in like 73, but they're just going to retire him for now. It's the deal is to get a token and to not send him directly to the Yankees. What Colorado chooses to do with Sparky Lyle was Colorado's business. 
and they make a trade directly with the Yankees. Colorado sends Sparky Lyle to the Yankees for Andy Costco. Now, the Yankees have to forfeit a token to Colorado. So the net tokens for Colorado, they gained one. Actually, I'm sorry, they lost one here. They gained one there. They net zero. Boston nets plus one. The Yankees go minus one. So Boston doesn't deal directly with the Yankees in this trade, but Sparky Lyle does end up on the Yankees. And Andy Costco is the prize that the Rockies really want because he is the typical home run hitter uh, outfielder in 1973 he's got an incredible card with power he's the type of player the Colorado Rockies covet Colorado also had a pretty terrible year in this past year when we look where they're drafting second overall so that 73 Costco card let me see if I can, if I have it up here let's go take a peek at this card so the particular card there they want is this one 73 Costco and limited number of plate appearances had nine homers and 118 at bats. That's a 280 batting average, a 346 on base, 568 slugging, 914 OPS, and it's 73. So the Rockies will have that card for four years. And that is a perfect player for an expansion team. As I mentioned before, expansion teams are the ones who usually pick up the fringe extra players that Stratomatic prints out because they frankly don't have a farm system and they're never going to get their hands on pure Hall of Fame players that uh, will stay on the traditional Major League Baseball teams. So that's why that trade made so much sense for Colorado. And frankly, Boston gets the token instead of Danny Cater, who they wouldn't have needed anyway because they had George Scott and Carl Yastrzemski playing first base. So Danny Cater made no sense in that move. And so that transaction's done. Another incidental trade, as all teams at this point had the right number of keepers, so it was basically just getting the reconciled and, and waived players aligned. St. Louis and Toronto deal aging switch hitting shortstops Tom Tresh for Dick Schofield. Schofield has a tiny bit of tread on his tire, so he's waived. Tresh does not, he's retired. Then utility, left-handed outfielder types, Jimmy Stewart and Frank Baker switch teams. Frank Baker's done in 1970, the outfielder Frank Baker. Jimmy Stewart, utility player, actually played for the 70s Cincinnati team that was in the World Series, but he's on waivers now, could play for anybody. And then one final trade to end the carousel, and this is a fun one. And uh, we'll go through this one. It's a straight-up trade. It's probably one of the few straight-up trades of keepers at the similar position and that is California sends Larry Heisel a guy they picked up from the 69 card had no affiliation at all with the Angels by the way so they got one great year out of him and then turn him over to the twins and the reason why that's so impactful is that Heisel disappears for a few years and comes back in 1973 for the twins and starts an outstanding career with the twins and so for basically nothing, the Angels pick up a really good Cesar Tovar, straight up trade. And the Twins are going to have to fork up a token. So the Angels also get a draft token in that maneuver. As um, Heisel has extra years, he's good through 1973. Tovar has only one or two years left, 70 and 71. The other reason why that trade was made, let's go take a look at the Twins. The Twins had some tricky reconciliation going on here in that at one point they had Harmon Killebrew, uh, Tovar, Ron Paranowski, and Pete Riker. We talked about how great the Twins were in 1969 and 1970 winning the American League West both years. The problem is these guys are all, their cards are all being activated in the year of 1970, particularly Killebrew, of course. And Paranowski's got an outstanding card in 70. Pete Reichert has a little bit more flexibility, and he's got a good 72 card. The reason why this is a, a troubling thing for the Twins to resolve is that you can only bring up uh, two guys in any particular year. 
So they know they're going to bring up Killebrew in 70, Paranowski in 70, Reichert and the other outfielder can't come up in 70. And so that's why they traded for Heisel, knowing that this is going to be a 73 card. And uh, as far as Reichert, it can be a 72 card. Some teams kind of know the year of the player they're locked into. Other teams have more flexibility. That's why it's important to have your traditional Hall of Fame guys and all-stars who are pretty consistent year in and year out because you can flex them into a year where you're particularly weak in talent. It's a kind of a mixture of uh, zenith and portents <laughs> or nice dates and instant gratification. <laughs> you got the guys with the long major league careers who, are, who do it year in and year out and then you got one of those guys who it's you know 360, 370, and 100 at bats, you know, one time in his career, and he becomes a star in the carryover league in a short sample size. Uh, like we saw in the case of uh, Andy Costco a few minutes ago. Um, it's, a sh it's a small sample size. But those small sample sizes work for expansion teams. Meanwhile, a traditional team like the Twins, Harmon Killebrew is not going anywhere. And Paranowski played for them, and Heisel would eventually play for him, etc. The Angels on the other end of that deal, uh, they're happy now with Tovar in center defensively because John Stone, who was playing center, is kind of more of a corner outfielder. Mickey Rivers is not really good defensively. And they'll have Bill Singer and McLaughlin. And they're going to get a bunch of draft tokens for making a lot of moves. Well, that's it tonight for this part of Keep, Wave, or Retire. We'll continue the series looking into the each of the card boxes, looking at cards, and do some more analysis of the data using the uh, spreadsheets. Kind of do a Tuesday, Thursday video. A one The Tuesday video will try and make it data oriented around the spreadsheets, and the Thursday video I'll just make it a live video of the Stratomatic cards and kind of analyze all the cards that are available. And Saturdays will be the game of the week in the Fall League. Thanks for checking this all out. We'll see you next time.